welcome everyone to day three of it. It's a Guy Thing Summit, and it's Wednesday, July 11th, and we're honored and excited to have Eric Schwartzman with us. And I'm going to just take a minute and let you know all about Eric. Eric is a father of two children uh, via donor insemination. Eric lives in New York and works in New York, and he's an expert on state and local taxation. And he brings his experience as being a blogger since 2005 on life as a dad to donor insemination kids as well as being the owner and chief moderator of the Yahoo discussion group, DI Dads, a male-only support group for men who have used donor conception methods to start their family or who are considered using donors for that purpose. The group was started in 2005 and currently has over 350 members. Wow, that's awesome. Eric contributed an essay titled, Hi, My Name's Eric and I'm Infertile, to the book Behind Closed Doors, Moving Beyond Secrecy and Shame, Voices of Donor Conception. And that was done by Mickey Morissette, and it detailed his thoughts on as an infertile parent. Eric's newest endeavor is the Donor Conception Postcard Project, which I am so excited to hear about, a community page set up on Facebook. The page, inspired by the website Post Post Secrets, posts the image contributed anonymously either via postcard or electronically. The concept is that anonymous, uh, anonymy, oh my goodness, my mouth isn't working, allows contributors to completely free and craft images with their thoughts and feelings on the topic of donor conception from every angle from donor, from the donors. Donors conceived individual and parents. In the past several years, uh, Eric off-ramped to raise his wonderful children and is now stepping back in the limelight, writing and speaking. And Sarah's on the line uh, right now, too, and we are just honored to have you here with us today talking about building a a family with sperm donation. So thank you so, so much for being here, and I apologize for my my mouth not working all that (laughs) wonderful right now. (laughs) But, Eric, thank you so much, and welcome. And, Sarah, welcome to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to come to be able to speak on the topic. It's something I've been dealing with for a number of years uh, with my own kids and just being involved in the donor conception community. And using the word donor, every other word, it, it's very easy to be a mouthful in this kind of uh, situation and stumble over words. So don't worry about that at all. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Eric, I um, I wanted to start off with I just I am so. Um, honored by your work with the iDads and the Yahoo group. I think it's it's a very rare thing to have a safe place for men to be able to explore um, different things. And and maybe we can start with some of the things that you've um, you've learned there. Uh, um, well, I, about that's that's a great place. Process. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great uh, – it actually was started by a, a gentleman that was a sperm donor himself. We had been corresponding and exchanging um, posts on the Yahoo group for Donor Sibling Registry, and he and I saw there was a need for a place where men can speak among themselves. And so he created this group on Yahoo, and then he stepped aside, and myself and a few other men stepped in and started running the group. And and basically what we see with the men that join the group – there's sort of a pattern that and once a man decides uh, or has been dealing with their infertility with their loved one, their spouse, their significant other, that they you know want to investigate this path, there's all sorts of questions that come up. And each time members join the group, you can see them starting with the same basic questions, the same basic fears as to how to address the topic, what does it mean, and how will they move forward in the creation of their families if they do choose to use donor conception, specifically donor insemination. And so it's a really interesting place, and there's a lot of great guys there that over the years have, you know, some people come, like any of these discussion groups, there are a few guys that stay on throughout the period. People drift in and drift out based upon their needs at the time. But what we've seen is the men, as I mentioned, start off with the same questions. What does this mean to me as a man? What does this mean to my marriage? How will this affect my relationships with any children that are born via donor conception? Or how will it relate 
relate to my family as a whole if I have other children that, you know, were born without the use of donor conception and, you know, how will my family react to itself? So it's an interesting place and it very often works in um, patterns that the same questions come up up and again. And so the men that have joined the group, some of them have been there throughout the period that they sort of act as peer counselors and giving advice to some of the newer men that join the group as to, you know, I've been there like you. I know what your feeling is. None of us are licensed counselors. None of us are trained uh, experts in the field. We're just all men that have been there, done that, and trying to give advice to other men and how they can, you know, walk down this path if that's the path they choose. So it's really Go ahead, Sarah. I'll wait, but... I'm. I, I'll just jump in. I am. I am just so. Uh, I just want to give you tons of kudos because it's so powerful. What you're doing is providing men a space to go and ask the questions that they need in and take down that mask. That you know. I don't know if you know what I do, Eric, but I work with women and couples going through fertility. So what ends up happening is that when male factor comes up in within the situation, there's so much inner turmoil going on for basically all the questions that you just listed that the pattern starts with. How does this affect me? How does it affect the whole? How does it affect my wife? And what I identify right along is that they're so protective of their partner within this situation that they don't give themselves permission to feel what they need to feel and ask what they need to ask. And what you just rattled off, I, I think just to take a moment and honor that because that is the most important uh, uh, for me, the emotional component, the center to be addressed and allowing that those concerns to be aired. You know, I come from a point of what I know now that I wish I knew then, and what you have done organically is created a structure that you're sharing what you know now that you wish you knew then. And yeah, in exactly. a way that I mean, was... Go ahead. I'm when sorry. I came on came on board, I mean when we when the group got created, I mean there was very few men out there that would openly discuss the issues. There were two uh this and, and over time, there's very few men out there that will actively blog about male infertility. There's a couple of guys out there right now, and like anything, as I said, there are some bloggers, they drift on, they drift off as their their needs change over time. But it it was rare at the time to be able to even get men into the group to be able to give them a space. I mean, a lot of the men that initially joined had been lurking on groups like the Donor Sibling Registry. The Donor Sibling Registry had a side group on Yahoo as well, and but they wouldn't participate participate that much. Usually it's only the women that participate in any of these bulletin boards that are around the country on different uh, servers that exist on the topic. And, and there's a lot, a lot of groups out there that are helpful to a lot of people, but there were very few places that the men can turn and speak to only men. Now, granted, I don't have the the vetting process to, it, because it's a male-only group, or at least that's, you know, how we try to bill it, it's still, you know, I don't have a um, an exact way to guarantee that, you know, every person that joins is only the husband or the male partner of a team of a, a, a couple that's looking to have children to have children but it works pretty well I think even in the rare cases where I think a woman has posed as a man to come into the group to better understand her husband or her partner they've been very respectful as to not interject or to do anything to make the men feel uh, that that safe space has been compromised and I think that has been the beauty of it that the men feel they can pretty much speak about anything about what's affecting their marriage how do they feel as a man? I mean, the initial topics always start off of, you know, will I feel less of a man? Will I, by using donor, am I less of a father? Am I less of a husband? And and you go through those those basic fears and starting that these men need to overcome if they choose to use donor conception. And there are a lot of pluses and minuses to using donor conception, but at this stage of the process, the man needs to understand what his feelings are, what his emotions are, and to be able to come to terms with them that sometimes in a normal uh, counseling situation, it's difficult for a man to come out and say something, even with his spouse right next to him, who he loves very much and who knows is there to support him. It's still difficult for many of these men to open up in those situations. And I, I know exactly
exactly what it's like because years ago, before we went uh, donor conception, we went through many donor conception, uh, donor support, excuse me, infertility support groups, couples, individuals. And so I think the men that originally came to the group had, you know, knew that route. And so they understood that they wanted to build a place. We wanted to build a place where the men can begin to open up and we can, we know what questions to ask each other to prompt people talking at this point. And, and some men are more open than others and some lurk for right. years until they finally say something. But right. I, I appreciate the kudos very much. It's, it's, I'm very proud of the group. And, and at times, I think, does 350 sound small compared to the U.S. population and world population, or is it big? And I, it, at the same time, I'm just happy that this amount of men have joined over time that can feel better about themselves okay. as they make the decisions they're going to make. Right. Well, that could be 350, but there's a ripple effect to that 350. And and so maybe on paper you're touching, you know, your membership is 350 people, but you have to look at what that support is doing into the, the whole, you know, ripple out to the whole, into families, into marriages. So it's not the number, it's what the energy is happening at your at your site. So yep, I'm just going to be quiet for a minute and let Sarah jump in because I know I keep cutting her off, so sorry, Sarah. <laughs> So I just, you know, like as I've, I've only been at this a short time. I've been at about a, about a year um, talking about this issue, and every time I've talked to a man, that that initial, that how does this affect me as a man? Um, it, it's very visceral. Um, I feel like a lot of the guys I've talked to have a very visceral reaction to um, to infertility in general and to donor to donor insemination specifically. What are some of the things that you see guys walking through in terms of going through the process of, whoa, th- this could be a reality for me too, I'm okay with it? It takes a little while for them to get there. Some have basically, they, you know, what I used at the time is my spouse uh, wanted the opportunity to be a mother as naturally as possible. And certainly when we went through standard IVF um cycles, uh, you know, I felt bad. Here it was my fertility, but she's the one that's getting poked and probed every day when we would go early morning before work. And, you know, it really affects you as a man because like, you're feeling not only you're guilty that you can't do what you, your body theoretically is supposed to do, but here your wife is suffering all the emotional drain, uh, draining uh, aspects of an IVF cycle, and she's the one getting poked and prodded. And so it only makes you feel more so like you've done something wrong, and it affects you internally. I think for the men, like you said, it, it's very visceral reaction. You do feel, you know, you question your manhood, you question your virility, you question your, your sense as being a husband. And, and that's a tough thing for the men to come to. I mean, even before you get to the questions of what does donor conception mean for our family and our children. So it's, it's a real tough thing, and it goes hand in hand with any, you know, the same thing that women go through is that what does it mean that I can't have a child or my eggs right. are not good enough to produce? And so there's a lot of parity in that sense, but it's right. Like when you have a marriage where it's defined whose body is not working, that's a lot of pressure internally and, and within a marriage. And so that comes out in the support groups, uh, male or female. Well, I have personal experience with that in, uh, you know, way back when. So we, when I uh, was in the process, it was 1995, 1996, and we had both male and female, but the male was diagnosed first through the post-coital, post-coital exam, which was humiliating. And I remember that moment, it was like the air got sucked out of the room and the panic came in and how mm-hmm. that information was disseminated to my husband at the time. Uh, we're no longer married, but it broke my heart because I was like, this situation didn't go very well, first of all, but the way it was orchestrated was horrific it was embarrassing humiliating and and then the aftermath and way back when and at, at that time infertility wasn't really out of the closet uh so mm-hmm. it wasn't as it is now that there wasn't the web and the support but i remember the conversation that you're talking about that visceral reaction within our marriage of well would you use donor sperm and then the anger you know, there was suppressed anger and directed anger. And so mm-hmm. here you are as a couple thrown into this situation, first of all, the fertility world, 
then you're it's it's such a major crisis on all levels of all aspects of your life and then you're having this conversation well would you use donor donor sperm no i won't yeah, i mean okay. for us it was basically we were using ivf with ICSI where they were going to do a biopsy on my testes to see if they can find sperm i my diagnosis is non-obstructive azoospermia so my my body is just not producing enough sperm to be viable uh, to, to, you know, the volume we really need to make the numbers work. And so when they were doing the biopsies, you know, we chose donor as a backup. You know, fortunately for the two uh, IVF ICSI cycles that we did, they found sperm and they were able to fertilize eggs, but they never took, which was unfortunate. But even at that point, you know, here you are, you know, you're going to go through surgery, and a lot of men have done the ICSI cycles back in time and over the years and even till through today, and you're hoping it's your stuff, and then they say, well, we'll use donor as a backup, and then some protocols and some clinics, they'll mix the two, so you really don't know right. which it is. And, and, and there's right. a lot of problems with that that I have as far as that it doesn't allow you to really address the situation. You never quite know is the child yours or not uh, right, from that standpoint right. and creates its own issues. But, yes, yeah, certainly the visceral reaction, the urologist that told me, I mean, I found out um, I had been born with some undescended testes, and so over the years I knew to check myself, thought I had found a mass. Because I thought I had mass, I went to a urologist. The urologist said, you should be okay. I'm not feeling cancer, but I want you to take a semen analysis. And from the semen analysis, it came up that my count was just not there. And the, the guy had no bedside manner whatsoever. I mean, my my oh. my wife at the time wanted to jump across the table and kill the guy for how you know absurdly yeah. he, he he stated it. And you know right. that was what it was at the time. Doctors were more clinical, and they weren't really uh, you know depending on who they are, they weren't people oriented. And so you go no. through that kind of visceral reaction, and you want to kill. Uh, but right. like for us, we decided. I started looking at donor conception when we realized it was out that route or adoption that we looked at it. So of as half adoption. We wanted to use her eggs. We wanted her to have as natural a uh, pregnancy as possible. The donor conception to us seemed like the best alternative to at least achieve our goals of, you know, once the insemination takes place and it takes, it's like any other pregnancy. And so we wanted right. that as much as possible. And that's how we came to it. But certainly, you know, the, the basic fears, then you, then you go through your next level of fears and questions that men feel like, how do I feel about another man, another man sperm entering my wife, whether it's, you know, obviously it's not through uh, sex, but it's through insemination. So you're like, okay, you feel a little better about that, but who is this man? Who Who is this person? Right. You know, we can get to how you choose, but you start having fears of that, will my wife down the road have dreams of who this man is? Will she run away with this guy? I mean, there's, there's some of the things that come up are amazing and fantastical, but they still come up in your mind as possible fears. Right, right. And how do you, as a group, address those fears? Because what, you know what I always say within my practice, I always say this, that movie Shrek, and, you know, when Shrek has gas, he says, you know, better out than in. And that's what mm -hmm. I always say to, to, the, to the, the gentleman that I have the privilege of having an open discussion about, you know, it's better out than in, and any way you can get it out is, is yeah. because feelings I change. mean, some of the men, we get them to talk about it by talking about our own stories. And when they see that, you know, the, the beauty of, of these discussion groups that are online that are via posting messages is that people have the ability to go back through the archives and read the stories that other people have posted. And I think right. once they start reading those stories and seeing that the same issues come up time and time again, it gives them the the courage to basically, you know, uh, stop lurking and ask their question or say, you know what, your story helped me. It was what I felt like. It's what I feel like. And so I, you know, think I can understand it better and process it better. But that's generally right. how we, so, you know, Eric, you get to you know that what? point. you know what is so helpful with this conversation. I, I want to scream from the mountaintop for all the women in my practice and everywhere to listen to this because it is what you're saying is the same pattern that women are feeling. And yep. and it's the same it, it feels the same to me. I shouldn't say it is. It feels the same to me. And the same fears, the same anxiety, the same anger, the same sorrow, the same what you're talking about, and then the thoughtfulness that I hear from your story about really acknowledging, and you you accurately spoke what you what your wife needed and what you wanted for her, and I feel that when uh, it's, for me within the group support groups and also the one on one, 
the disconnect that I have is that men, when it's either male or female factor, men really don't know what to do. Right. What, what can I do? I just want her back. What can I do? She's not the same woman. You know, what can I do? And, of course, men are programmed like that, right? But what mm-hmm. you're saying so thoughtfully about your message board is what women do. They talk about their story, they share about their story, and then they, they don't feel alone, right? And you know yep, that you're not the, the same only thing. one going through this. Right. I mean, it's not easy. I mean, there are some men that, you know, that they just don't have the ability to vocalize their story or vocalize their fears. And so, you know, you do your best you can you, you, with any of these groups or any of these message board situations. You know, you're going to have some successes. You're going to have some situations where people decide this isn't the path for me. And, and you have some situations where people may disagree, I mean, as to how they can handle it. I mean, I certainly have men that can never get past the fact that another man's sperm is entering their wife's body. I mean, I've run into that a number of times, and there's only so much you can do. And certainly there are people that have come on and had depression in regards to the issues where we tell them, said, look, you need to get help. You need to talk to a real licensed social worker or somebody because your facts are different than certainly that we can handle. We want to be there as support for you, but you've got issues beyond that right now none of us are equipped to handle through just talking or being supportive. You know, speak to a counselor, come back. We'll certainly try to work with you as best we can. And and that runs the gamut, whether it's male or female. And I think, but, right. you know, men are, are, you know, that old book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, that right. men are programmed differently in how they think they always can fix a situation, how they cannot fix a situation. Right. And you need to, what we try to do is get around that or work our way through it as saying that, look, this is what I did. This is what I was able to do. I spoke to other dads. I mean, fortunately, I live in New York City where, you know, there's a lot of people of a lot of different backgrounds. I mean, donor conception in New York City is pretty common between different population groups that are here, whether it's uh, same-sex couples, single mom families. So it's, you know, you don't feel, when you start to see that there are other kids in the playground, you start to say, well, my kid's not going to be that bad off. There's other kids like him or her. So maybe that part of my fears goes away a little bit. And so, um, you know, you start chipping away at what things can work for people if this is the path people should choose. And and over the years, I have to say, some of my arguments or some of my feelings about donor conception have changed. I mean, I am not a 100% pro-donor conception. I'm not a 100% uh, con-donor conception. I've come to a point in the middle where I, I know all the people on both sides of the discussions that I can bring up the different arguments pro and con. I, you know, one of the things I had mentioned um, is that the, how donor conception is handled in this country is very different from some of the other English-speaking nations. You know, when you think about we're creating a child, we do more in this country for towards the adopt and adoption process than we do through the donor conception process. And what I try to do is incorporate some of the mindsets that go with that as far as how people should address whether donor conception is for them or whether they're ready for it. And that comes into play on the group as well. I mean, people, once they get past the initial fears, then we start talking about how do we, you know, what are the next steps? Will I bond with this child? You know, how does it go from there? I mean, will the child know I'm a fake? That's one of the fears dads come up with. Will they know I'm not biologically their father? And so then you start addressing those kind of questions. And it usually comes down to something as silly saying, look, once you start, you know, since moms in the most case do more, you know, nowadays with people breastfeeding, moms pretty much handle a lot of the feedings. If a father's involved with a feeding, that's how you're going to start bonding. And when the father starts changing diapers, that's how a, a father starts bonding. And we tell dads, look, you, you, we understand your worry. We understand your concern. But believe me, once you hold that child for the first time and that child starts recognizing the love you feel, it may still recognize the fears you have, but as long as you, in your mind, are honest, you know, the bonding is going to start. And so those fears start to be addressed. And so you go through the process. Like we said before, you start with what are your fears for yourself? What are your fears for your wife and a, as a husband? What are your fears as a father? And that's how we take it through with that group and anybody I've ever dealt with uh, with this issue. So wow, that's, that's interesting. It, it's interesting and, and beautiful. And I, I, I want to follow up and ask um, how how does that bonding how does that bonding look, and what is the process? What have you seen guys, um, you know, share and your own experience with just like that day that you meet 
you meet that little person the first time. I mean, in in our situation, you know, we we conceived our our kids together, um, but it still took my husband a while to bond with the children because you know it, it it's I think naturally the beginning stages of life are are much more maternal. They're they're mm-hmm. um, you know feeding well, and whatnot. I think it depends but then, again you know, how turn into toddlers, then then it's all about dad. <laughs> right, <so laughs> depending on the child but yeah i know what you mean I, I i think for what i've seen and from what the men have seen it, it comes down to you know I, what we tell the men be involved as you can the, be as involved as you can based upon your work arrangement daycare arrangements home arrangements you know the more you you have contact with the child the more you're going to bond with the child. I think more that you're supportive of your spouse and can you know, what is your role? What is like my spouse, uh, former spouse, uh, nursed our children for about a year and a few months each of them. So my role every night when it came time to feeding was to make sure the chair where she would sit was set up, that she I would get her tea or I would get food within reach, make sure something as silly as the TV control is within reach, that this was my role as part of that uh, experience every time there was a feeding that I would try to help them and both of them, I would bring her the baby. So she would get herself ready, use the restroom, whatever, then go sit down in the chair. And so, you know, she would not get the baby each time. My job was to bring the baby to her. So I got to hold him or her. We have two children, a boy and a girl, that part of the feeding was that the baby felt my skin against them, my arms, my chest, before I handed the child to her and she would begin nursing. So we tell dads to get involved, you know, with that, tell them to get involved with changing diapers, um, you know, just anything you can do that makes you more comfortable and know who the child is and the child sees your face. I mean, the first time ma- mom or dad, the first time a baby looks up at you and consciously smiles and you know it's not from gas, that you're just in heaven. I don't care who you are. You could be the biggest guy in the world, the biggest macho guy. When a baby is going to smile at you or uh, clasp your finger with their whole hand, you're going to melt. I don't care who you are. And so, I mean, the first time you see the baby when the baby's born, I mean, like my daughter, the first time I saw her, my my first child was, uh, she delivered him totally uh, naturally in a, in a uh, with a doula and a midwife here in New York City. Uh, and my second one ended up being a plan C-section. And so the second one, when the doctor lifted her over the, you know, the curtain and said, here's your daughter. And, um, you know, from that second, my wife just said, okay, forget me, you follow the baby and wherever they take her within this hospital. Anything you can do that's part of the process of that baby having first experiences, you want to do. And so, and, and that's no different from any father, you know, whether it's a biological right. father or, a, or in this case, right. a uh, father via donor conception. I think it's just being involved and in having your face in there. Now, some, you know, then it becomes a question also, and we can get into this as we move further along in our conversation, is what is your plan down the road? I mean, I would say 90% of the couples in this country, I'm not quoting any study, I don't know, I'm just saying this from experience and from what I've read, the majority of couples in this country who use donor conception probably still don't tell their children they would be a donor conception. And those numbers probably have come down over the last 10 to 15 years. But for years, you know, it was very easy to hide when it was male factor. If you use donor, you know, the father felt safe. No one's going to know it's not his sperm. So families didn't have a reason to tell. They didn't really, you know, it was uh, when I grew up in the 60s and early 70s, it was still somewhat of a stigma if kids were adopted. And nowadays, that's not really an issue anymore. And donor conception is sort of, you know, walked into that role that's still, you know, at least in the last 10 to 15 years, it's certainly gotten better that there was a stigma attached to this for all the reasons we talked before about fears on the mother's side or the father's side. And so I think it just comes down to... uh, excuse me, getting involved in trying to address those fears. But after you start having the bonding situation, the next thing that comes into play within the first number of years is that, you know, who are you telling? Did you, you know, when you used donor conception, did your parents know? Did your siblings know? Did your clergy know? Did you choose to tell anyone? What are your thoughts on telling? What are the issues involved with it? So I think there's, a, there's, there's always a process of going on as far as 
what questions need to be addressed. I mean, I always tell people, and one of the things I learned early on during this process is, because I had children doesn't mean my infertility was cured. I am still an infertile male and can't biologically have children. So I may have cured the pain of not having children in my life by using donor conception, but what does that mean? I, I've solved my issue, but are there still issues out there as far as what does donor conception mean? Because every time you walk into a doctor's office with your children to the pediatrician, the first thing they're going to ask you is, what, are your fam- what is your family history? Well, if you don't have that family history, that can be an issue as the child grows up as to, you know, is there heart conditions in the family? Are there allergies that parents had, the donors have? And so going into donor conception, you need to think of more than you're just your own for infertility as to what will it mean to your lives and the children's lives. So, you know, then it comes down to is that I've conquered my fears as a father, but have I created other fears for the child? Have I created other issues for um, his growing up? Is it possible he could meet somebody that's also donor conceived? Could they be from the same donor? I mean, there's all sorts of crazy things that come into the decision-making of whether you're going to use donor conception. There's openness issues, there's secrecy issues, there's medical issues, genetic issues, heritage issues. And, you know, it sort of leads you into the first natural step where you address that is how you choose a donor. I mean, do you just go to, you know, do you rely on, in the old days, you didn't have choices in the United States. You pretty much, you know, the doctor would say, I know somebody that can donate sperm. And usually that was another resident at the hospital or something like that. So you hear a lot of stories of people who were donor conceived in their, you know, I'm 50 years old. I've met a lot of people that are in their 60s plus that are donor conceived. They know nothing about their donor. And and the banks are not there or weren't there. It's something they just worked with through the gynecologist, found the donor that can help the situation. So the the how it is in this country being very consumerism based that you can go onto a website for any of the major cryobanks, look up what you know you want to you know what is your hey I'm you know I have blonde hair I have blue eyes I'm in this relative shape I can find a donor that looks just like me by going on the websites. But you know going into that process you have to say, what am I looking for? What am I looking to do? I mean, am I looking to, you know, you don't want to get into a game of eugenics and basically bioengineering your kid. But the truth is, everybody goes in and says, you know, with the bios, well, my family has a history of heart conditions. You know, it would be nice if the donor's family doesn't have a history of heart conditions that the kid maybe doesn't have to worry about that. So there's all sorts of questions that come up in choosing a donor and in choosing what type of donor that couples need to address um, after they get over their own fears if donor conception is something they can mentally handle for themselves. Right. So what... what, Go ahead, Kristen. So what I have seen uh, within my clients is um, I have two questions. I've been taking notes as you were talking, but, you know, we, I, I help create this fertility game plan, and it's, you know, all the, the questions or the, the, the concerns or the directions, you know, before, during, and after the process. And so what, what I have learned from, you know, being part of these over so many years is that there's different modalities. I had an accountant who used a spreadsheet, you know, before, during, and after. <laughs> there's a spreadsheet. You click on here. That brings you over here. And it was a woman who was the accountant, you know. And so she, that's how she organized this information and how she kept herself on track and how you gain a sense of control by having, you know, this plan. And all of the details that you just spoke about, are part of that plan. It's part of a fertility game plan. It's part of your birthing plan, and it's also part of your parenting plan, right? So you have Mm -hmm. these three stages that everybody moves through. So I want to share and get your input about this. So within my practice, I have women who have male, uh, who are in relationships, uh, either married, unmarried, that are that are using donor sperm, and then either their partner is involved or their partner is involved. But one of the the cases that I want to talk about is that um, the gentleman was not involved at all. You know, he wasn't home a lot. She basically would come to group and have the book that you're talking about that you could pick and, and narrow it down and have donors and flip through the book and say, okay, this is an option, this is an option. And so, you know, not to age me, 
but I was, I, it just struck me that day about, you know, the yin and yang, the blessing and the curse in the situation was, here's this, this um, amazing opportunity and choices for family building, right, from, for, mm-hmm. from two decades ago, that these women could be sitting in a support group with the bank's books on their lap, slipping through like you were looking through a magazine, you know, orchestrating yep. and, and dreaming, dreaming a different way of creating <laughs> a family, right? But also, yep. oh, my God, you're sitting in the place and there's this, all these options for you, and, and then you have the partner who's not connected. You know, basically, let me know when you get pregnant and then I'll step in, but I'm, I don't want any part of being in the selection process. I don't want to know. I'll just support you when we're pregnant. And so is there a, a pattern that you see of men engaged in the beginning or at the beginning of the process and or not engaged in the beginning of the process? Yeah, you know, I mean, is, it, it runs is there the a gamut. Bell curve, I mean, I've... what I'm trying to get at, you know? Yeah, I mean, it definitely runs the gamut. I think the majority of men I've talked with, you know, via these sites and discussions is that the majority of men, I think, want to be involved in some way. I mean, some, you know, are a little squeamish, you know, certainly the, the, the not all of them are in the room during the donor insemination. Many are uh, when you get to that point. But I think a lot of them initially leave it to their spouses to choose, you know, what are your top five possibilities of who you want to choose. I think sometimes for some men sitting there going through, whether it's a book or on screen, for some of the men, it's a little demoralizing, just as I'm sure for women who are looking at donor eggs, it's the same kind of thing, that I think many of them um, are involved. Most I know have been involved with the final selection. Uh, In my case, my spouse said, you take the first crack. She said, look, we're trying to find somebody that is, you know, as close to you as possible. At least that was our decision-making process. So she said, you take the first crack. Now, we, we happen to be, our background is that we're Jewish, and there weren't a lot of Jewish donors back in the, you know, early, you know, late 90s when we were going through it. And so your selection was a little bit limited. So it depends what you're looking for. But for us, you know, she said, you start, and then, you know, after you get down to, like, you know, a dozen, but, you know, some banks didn't even have a dozen Jewish donors. So, you you know, that's what you have to deal with. And I know people go through that, certainly of Asian backgrounds, of black backgrounds. There's not a lot of donors, depending on where you're going and what backgrounds you may be looking for. So it pretty runs the, pretty much runs the gamut as far as how involved men are. I think at first they're a little squeamish about the idea. It's a little uncomfortable sitting in front of the screen or looking at a book. But I think most when they realize the importance of what it is, start getting involved. I mean, for us, uh, um, one of the main things was looking for commonalities of ethnicity backgrounds or commonalities of religion uh, as much as possible. And so we were trying to see that, you know, if down the road someone's going to look at the child, inevitably, whether it's biologically your child or not, people look for things to say, oh, he looks like you. You know, well, when right. you hear that and you know it's not your child, the first couple of times you hear it, oh, it cuts like a knife inside of you, like it's unbelievable, even though because you know it's not true. And you, you want to scream out, you idiot. You don't see that this child isn't mine, but, you know, you hold it back. But I think most men run the gamut and do get involved. There are some occasions I've run into men where they absolutely don't want to be part of the process, sort of like the example that you were bringing. And emotionally, I can't understand that. But for some people, that's how they deal with it. But I just think, you know, from a only because I've been talking about this stuff and dealing with men now for almost 10 years on this topic, I feel like he's setting himself up. He's burying something inside that can be a powder keg later on that what is the relationship going to be on this child? You know, even though he said he didn't want to be part of the process, when he isn't part of the process, is that going to set up a wall between him and that child that will be unnecessary and damaging to both of them as they go ahead? So it runs the gamut. I mean, I think it it depends, like you said, you know, now the idea that you can have a physical book in front of you and it's like choosing college level graduate courses is insane to me because I, you know, I got married back in the mid 90s and we put off infertility for a while, even though we knew it when we got married uh, until emotionally and financially we were able to handle infertility because it's not a cheap thing. I mean, going through regular IVF cycles can be the most damaging thing to a marriage because all of a sudden financially your marriage isn't on safe ground anymore when there's no insurance coverage. 
And so, you know, some people skip IVF and maybe they go right to donor insemination in some form because it's cheaper and faster. It depends on what couples can do. So those those game plans, you know, have to take into account finances, unfortunately, right. in, in starting right. a family, which is the, the shame of it in most cases. But I, going back to your question, right. most men I've discussed, if they've gotten to the point they've reached out to the group before they've started the process, those men I've seen are usually the ones that are more involved in the process. I think it, it's getting to the men that haven't um, addressed the other issues first that I think it's going to be harder for them to join in the process. So the question I would have, too, and I would have, uh, I, I know we're coming, that was a quick, uh, we're almost up to an hour, which is amazing, quick time, just flew by so fast. Um, if if you had a brand new person in front of you who was just confronted with this news, this you know devastating, heartbreaking news, right? Um, mm-hmm. What would be the one one pearl of wisdom that you would share with them? That one thing that that kept your fortitude and and kept your perseverance and and you know I I'm a big girl on mantras. You know, when when I talk to women who come to me totally broken and hopeless, and and I think this conversation is so powerful and so strong because what you're doing is just giving voice to the other side of this. That it really infertility. I I don't like the word infertility. I like fertility challenges, but it it knows no bounds. You know, it it levels everyone to the same place right. when you get that diagnosis. I mean, I- I think the one thing, certainly, uh, you want to keep your marriage strong. Uh, that's one. That's not the pearl of wisdom yet, but that's the one thing I think you have to do. You can't let your marriage be hurt by this. If your marriage suffers, it's going to hit everything down the road in some form, and you need to be strong with that. But the pearl of wisdom, or the thing that I have come to at this point, is that your purpose here is the creation of a life, a child. My thought that I tell everyone is you have to think of the child first. You may have pains, you may have issues, you may have fears, but when it comes down to it, the child's um, safety mentally, physically, it has to be the child first. Any decision you make, in my mind, has to think of how it's going to affect that child. What issues are they going to deal with? So, you know, I, like I said, we're coming up on an hour quickly that the, the issues that I think that parents have to think of or intended parents have to think of is that, you know, when, I, when you choose a donor, what kind of donor are you choosing? Is it going to be an anonymous donor? Why are you choosing an anonymous donor? Is that for your safety and sanctity of mind down the road or is it for the child's benefit? So I think they have to think of the choose whether they want to use an anonymous donor or via an ID release program donor which in most cases mean that at 18 the child has the right to go to the bank and the bank agrees, if the donor agrees, to get the name and perhaps a mailing address for the donor if the child wants that at that point. So you need to think of the child first of what questions may they have. So that comes into play as part of choosing a donor. Even before that, or rather after you choose the donor, again, thinking of the child's needs first, do you tell the child or do you keep this a secret from the child? And, you know, every family has its own mechanism as to whether they are close enough that they can trust each other, that, you know, it won't affect their relationship to each other, won't affect the relationship to the children. I hear so many stories of people find out that after the father died, the mother then sends to the, says to the young adult, teenager or adult, your father wasn't really your father. And so the child may be like, I always felt like something was off, but that explains this. How can you tell me this now? I would have wanted to speak to dad about this. So again, you have to think of the child when you have questions of, is this thing going to be a secret or are you going to be open with your child as that comes into play? I have to say to you that 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 line of thinking if we had every man on the planet with that pearl of wisdom going into fatherhood, thinking of the child first, think about how everyone would be affected by that, how this planet would be united in love, because what you're saying is so profound and, and touches the whole world. 
think of how that every child would feel, regardless if you came into this world through donor sperm or donor egg or whatever, if it was about the child first. So it has to be. I mean, I, it's who's going to live on I, after I you. Just, right. I believe that, you know, we all have a mission here on this wonderful earth. And that phrase right there, think of your child first, and I, I don't want to get on my little spoke, spokes box, you know, so, soapbox, but right then and there, a, a man who, who puts that intention out there and lives that intention with every decision is uh, father of the year in my book. <laughs> don't you think, Sarah? <laughs> because that is, ra- that is raising resilient, um, grounded amazing individuals. So right then and there, regardless of how the baby comes into a family, if that's the family's philosophy, then this world will be a, a amazing place to be. So it thank would be you, nice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You know, thank you. Thank you. So, Sarah, why don't you come on in, because I've been yapping <laughs> with Eric here. So want to come on in and close and ask whatever we um, – Want to want to share and then have Eric share his websites and contact information. Well, I just think that was such a beautiful closing. I don't even want to ruin it. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> we either. ended I'm, on the point. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm it's like so that. I, I think coming up on Father's Day here. Um, I, you know, my my sentiments are, are exactly that. That, you know, I I I um, came into this um, because I really support fatherhood and I think that fatherhood is probably one of the most important institutions that um, our country needs, but I mean the world needs. And um, supporting men in really taking on the, 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 the challenge of fatherhood, however they arrive at it, and, and recognizing that their love for their children um, is what makes, their father, make them, makes them a father. Um, father. Right is 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 exactly it, and 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 you know supporting men to be um, to be good fathers and also to be to be healthy and to look at themselves and take care of their health. That's the other that's the other side of it because they should be there. So um, so, but thank yep, you, Eric, for just. Eric, we're gonna You're so welcome. tweet that. We're so tweeting that <laughs> statement. <laughs> that's a tweet tweet for forever. You know. Well, think I mean, of your I, I can't first. say I came. I'm, I'm not the first person to come up with it. I mean, like I said, I've been working or writing and talking with people in this the donor conception community for some time, and there are a number of people like me that how we look at this process and how we look at the questions of uh, secrecy versus openness with the children and the questions of how you choose a donor – That's pretty much been the mantra, whether it's Wendy Kramer, who I think is one of the uh, certainly one of the uh, four people in the forefront here in the United States with her donor sibling registry, that that's been the question, always the issue, rather, that you have to put the children first. So I can't claim credit for that pearl of wisdom, but it's something I certainly have always agreed with, even though I may not have known the terminology at the time when I started. I mean, the, the resources that are out there for parents and men are growing. I think they have to seek it out. They need to look for whether there are some male factor infertility bloggers out there that are very good. There's a few people that are on Twitter that, you know, from a male perspective will bring it up uh, at a time. So, you know, look for that. There's so much social media today. People just have to really look for it and delve into it to find it. I mean, certainly the the people that are looking for uh, for the Yahoo group that I work with, all they really have to type into Google is, is uh, DI Dads Yahoo group, and that'll take them there as far as finding a link to be able to join that group. I mean, my blog, I admit I haven't been writing as much, um, but I've been a constant over the years that I get to it at least a couple of times a month. I mean, that life is a, a dad, the donor insemination kids. People just have to search my name, Eric Schwartzman Infertility. They'll find some of those resources in some form. Uh, but it's a, just a question of that people need to, you know, do their research. I mean, for people that may be listening from, you know, say the United Kingdom, one of the best groups out there, wherever you are in the English-speaking world, is the Donor Conception Network. Uh, friends of mine are involved with running that organization, and they have a great series of pamphlets called Telling and Talking that, you know, help, gives people some of the words of how to 
to discuss this with their children from two years old up to adults. I mean, there's a number of good resources people should think about. But again, as we mentioned before, uh, the thing to take away from this conversation is think of the children first and, and base all your decisions on, you know, how it's going to affect your children and how it affects your, your marriage and, and as a family. I think it, that's what it comes down to. And even families that, I mean, my kids, uh, my kids deal with this issue. My kids deal with divorce. You know, it, it all comes down to communication. And, you know, the more communication you can have between spouses, the more communications you have with your children. Although my children, because I deal with this all the time, are at the point they don't care anymore. Um, they just want me to stop. But that's any, you know, kids that are becoming teenagers. They're like, what are you talking about now? But I think you know, the resources are there. I'm more than happy to talk to people if they want to contact me. There's plenty of ways to contact me out there. And uh, hopefully this helps. Great. Thank you so, so much. And once again, all your contact information will be on the registration page for It's a Guy Thing Summit, which is running this whole week. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And happy Father's Day, Eric. And, um, thank you very I'm, much. I'm uh, blessed to have had this conversation with you. Bye, Sarah. Hun. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.